Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this Ezra UK webinar. It's great to have you all here with us today, and thanks so much for taking the time to join us. We're going to be looking at how charities and nonprofits are taking a geographic approach to their work in order to advance their charitable missions. We've got an exciting array of topics to present to you over the next hour, and we'll be getting started in just a moment. But first, let's just run you through what to expect. So I'm going to start off by setting the scene for today's call and telling you why we wanted to bring this community of users together. I'll then introduce you to our nonprofit program and offering, and this might be a recap for some of you on the line. Thirdly, I'll be handing over to some of my colleagues to showcase the different ways our software can be used to tackle typical spatial questions charities might face. Fourthly, we're delighted to have a guest speaker with us today, Luke Phillips from Ramblers Scotland, and we'll be hearing all about how they have been engaging the volunteers across Scotland to map the best ever path network. And if that's not enough, we'll be finishing up with a session by my colleague Max, who will be looking at how we're celebrating the successes with GIS by some of our charity customers. We'll finish up with a bit of a wrap up and end with a Q&A as well. So just onto some housekeeping first, please do note that this webinar is being recorded. We'll also be engaging you in a live poll in just a few moments. So if you do have a smartphone to hand, um, please do grab this. Also, if you've got any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them into the Q&A area of the Microsoft Teams app that you can see at the top bar. And we'll get to them at the end in the Q&A session. Our idea is that we'll chat through them. And any questions that we run out of time to get an answer to you with, uh, we will try and get them back to you via email. And talking of emails, uh, just to let everyone know, there will be a follow up email sent to you and it's going to include a link to the recording, links to resources that have been mentioned and also link to a feedback survey as we're always keen to hear your thoughts and perhaps topics on future or topics for future webinars. OK, so let's now introduce you to the presenters for today's webinar and I'll start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Hattie Gwilt and I am our nonprofit sector lead here at Esri UK and I've been with Esri for over seven years now and my role is to manage the nonprofit programme and to maintain the relationships with our charity customers. I'm joined by my colleague Max. Hi everyone, I'm Max Tyndall and I've been at Esri UK for about three years. I'm a customer success manager working in the nonprofit and government sectors. I'll pass over to Tash. <laughs> Thanks Max. Hi everyone, I'm Tash Senior and I'm a customer success consultant with our pre-sales team here at Esri UK. Um, so I've been around for um, just over a year and a half and today I will showcase um, some of the use cases of GIS for you. I'll pass you over to Balkis. Hi everyone, my name is Balkis Mazwir and I am a graduate consultant currently working alongside Tash in the pre-sales department. And um, I'm now going to pass over to Luke. Uh, good morning everybody, uh, my name is Luke Phillips and I'm the project manager um, at Ramblers Scotland for the Mapping Scotland's Path project. Perfect. Well, thank you all. And we're going to look forward to hearing you uh, from you a little later in the webinar. OK, so I just wanted to take a moment up front to reflect on why we were all here today. Um, and basically, I saw this as an opportunity to unite a community of users that have something in common. Um, you all work for or are associated with a charitable organisation of some kind. And you have an interest in what a geographic approach can do to better your work and the overall mission of your organisation, be it reducing homelessness, food poverty or perhaps even biodiversity loss. Um, we recognise that this is a really special group of users and that you're all giving something back to the planet in some way. You're looking to make it a better place. Is it safer, fairer, more sustainable or perhaps just healthier? And this webinar is a chance for us to recognise the important work that this group do and to inspire and support you in the ways geography can help you achieve those missions to ultimately make the world a better place. OK, so I'd now like to take a moment to find out who we have on the webinar with us today. And to do this, we have a live poll. So, Max, um, if you're able to come back um, yes. just to help give everyone some guidance on how to reach that interactive poll to vote. 
Perfect. So if you've got your smartphone, then please scan the QR code that you can see on screen. It should take you straight to the poll. And if that's not working, um, feel free to use your browser. So if you go to www.menti.com, it should take you straight to the poll and you'll see at the top that the question is, what cause does your charity work towards? Please just um, select whichever cause fits best and um, all of the results should start to appear on screen now. OK, great. I can see that lots of results are coming through already. That's great. Um, and so the breakdown of the categories, uh, essentially choose whichever one fits best. So by animal, it might be you work for an organisation that focuses on wildlife conservation, maybe a pet or animal welfare organisation or something like a zoo. Yeah, I was going to say arts and culture as you kind of museums, art galleries, historical societies. Yeah, got a few of those. Brilliant. Yeah, and I can see that, yeah, lots of results coming in, still coming in, I think. Um, health services might be some uh, a non-profit that investigates disease or perhaps a patient and family support charity. Yeah, and, and um, we're probably seeing the numbers maybe changing slightly because you might have several causes that you are answering to. Um, and yeah, just to clarify, so international NGO can be, you know, international development work, disaster relief, humanitarian response, perhaps even conservation efforts overseas or peace and human rights angles, those kind of things. But I, I think, yes, I think we've levelled out at totals, which is really, really interesting. So actually, I think we've got a massive spike for environmental causes being being sought um, and causes around, yeah, passing on education and health is pretty high too, which is quite interesting. Definitely. And it's really nice to have a spread across all of the categories. That's really good to see. Um, lovely to see some people from arts and culture here too. So um, yeah, that's been been brilliant to have a look at. Yeah, thanks all for uh, your participation there. OK, let's just hop back into the slides. Wonderful. OK, um, so what are Esri UK doing to support the nonprofit sector? Well, you may or may not know, but we have a nonprofit programme and essentially this is a special channel that enables nonprofits and charities to access our ArcGIS software and resources at significantly discounted rates. So, for example, our desktop product is discounted by 99.9% really um, and that's a lot of value in terms of the technology there for what is basically what we're looking to be an admin fee and so we do this discount because we recognize that GIS can be a critical tool for charities to use when making maps, running analysis, looking at trends and patterns in that data, perhaps sharing that data with other organizations and collaborating, telling public stories around your work and ultimately helping you make better data driven decisions. So we discount our, our software. We also discount our training through our learning services and we also put discount on our consultancy services as well. Um, now I have included premium data here as well because a lot of the partners that we work with and that can provide data through us um, sometimes have those nonprofit discounts as well, although it is determined by the partners, but always worth asking. Um, so really these discounts are in place to make the tools more accessible to you as a as a sector. And if you are interested to apply to the program, if you're not already on it um, and see if your organization is available, then please do. You can either Google the Esri nonprofit program or you can wait for the link that will be sent in the follow up email, um, hopefully tomorrow or indeed just contact myself. OK, so for some context as well around this nonprofit sector that we're interacting with, we've got over 350 charities on our UK programme to date, and this number is growing with around 50 new charities embarking on a new GIS journey with us every year. And we've been evolving the programme's offering over time, and I'd like to update you on just a few new features of the programme that are worth knowing about. So firstly, we launched the nonprofit eStore over summer, which means for those of you already approved on the programme and who are already using the software, you can visit this eStore online and buy additional licences or add-on licences as and when you need them. So ultimately, we're hoping that this should make your buying process a bit easier. Secondly, Esri have launched a nonprofit partner specialty badge. So if you need the help of a partner solution or some partner consultancy, you can visit our partner directory or the ArcGIS marketplace and filter by this specialty. And that way, you know that the partner has either worked with other nonprofits in the past or they've got discounted rates. 
Okay, we're going to change gear now and move on to the next section of the webinar, which will showcase the technology in action. So Tash, I'm going to hand to you. Brilliant, thanks Hattie. Um, so now I'm going to show you some GIS use cases in the charity sector. Um, and I'll give you a flavour for how GIS delivers value to nonprofits. And then I'll pass you over to Balkis, who will give some live demos of visualising and gaining insight from location and also volunteering in the field. And at the end, I will dip into how you can leverage the power of imagery and also gain real time situational awareness. So GIS delivers a lot of value to nonprofits to help solve some of the world's modern problems whether it is crisis response during severe weather events or even during COVID to understand where infection risk is and help charities protect our population. So this could be knowing where to distribute aid packages or community outreach. GIS can also be incredibly effective for conservation by understanding a wealth of data. So that could be marine mammal migration routes alongside shipping routes and coral bleaching to start to delineate sanctuary or conservation planning. And it also plays a major role in humanitarian work like spatial mod modeling and data insights to analyze population dynamics. And in terms of ArcGIS, it's a comprehensive geospatial system bringing together systems, workflows and content. So I like to think of it as um, three core systems. Firstly, a system of record. So it allows you to ingest multiple sources of data from traditional um, vector features like points, lines and polygons to helping you extrude buildings into 3D or even bringing in CAD and BIM data from the Autodesk or Bentley worlds. But it also provides um, a data management system and this ability to capture data. So once you have your data, you can then push it into this system of insights to understand patterns in your data and to gain insight. So we have a rich range of analytical tools baked into our products from simple data visualization like heat maps to rich spatial analyt analytics like spatial interpolation or classification. And then you may want to then push this out um, into maps or apps through our system of engagement to tailor these to different audiences. So whether you're looking at um, stakeholders with no GIS knowledge, who simply want to see the progress of an initiative and the key me metrics through a dashboard. Or you could be creating a public application with limited capabilities um, just to push it out um, for people to view. The system is also um, designed as an integrated system that supports multiple deployment patterns. So whether you're on a desktop like ArcGIS Pro, you're using it on premise, or in the cloud um, within ArcGIS Online. It allows you to then push out this um, data into different web applications, mobile applications, or even connecting it um, to open APIs. But however it is deployed, it sits on lots of hosted content and services. So you can start to bring in your local data, tap into online content like our Living Atlas, or connect to open systems. And the real power within this system is that it provides this one source of truth. And so if a map is um, created and data has been captured in the field, this will stay up to date in um, wherever it is deployed and whoever's looking at it. So now I'm going to pass you on to Balkis, who's going to show you how you can visualise and gain insight from location data. OK, thank you, Tash. OK, first of all, I would like to introduce the Living Atlas to you all. The Living Atlas is a curated catalogue of geospatial content with many contributions from organisations such as the Ordnance Survey, the British Geological Society and many more. 
As you can see, there is a wide variety of data available, such as live data streams and time-enabled dynamic imagery. And Tash will give us a further insight into this shortly. I will be using data from the Living Atlas to create this map. It is a map of priority river habitats and storm overflow locations for the River Tees catchment in 2021. So let's dive into the live demo. As you can see here, this is our map viewer interface. In the center, we have our map. And to the left, we have a sidebar which holds some really useful tools. For example, the add button, we can add a variety of different data formats into our map. Within the layer catalog, we can turn layers on and off and view the layers that are already within our map and control the drawing order. We can also add, add new layers directly into our layer catalog by using the add layer button. If we have configured any tables, they would appear under the tables bar. The base map tool allows us to change um, the base map style of our map and similar to tables, any charts we have configured will appear under charts. We also have a legend for our web map. So now let's return to layers and zoom into our river tees catchment. Okay, and now let's turn on our priority river habitat layer. As you can see here, it's quite difficult to differentiate between a priority river habitat and our normal rivers layer. So let's change the symbology of our rivers layer. To do this, all we need to do is click on the layer and it will bring up our properties tab. Within properties, we can review the information of our data, look at the symbology, um, change the transparency if we wish, and set the visible range. To edit the layer style, we can simply go into edit layer style or click on the three shapes here to bring up the styles toolbar. Let's go into styles options and change the symbol style. Using the color picker, I'm going to go for a bright blue color. Change the width of my lines and the transparency. Once I'm happy with that, I'll go ahead and click done. As you can see, we've now added a sense of visual hierarchy to our data, and it's easy to identify which is a priority river habitat, yet still having context of the wider river network. Let's go ahead and block out all the rivers outside my catchment of interest. Okay, now I want to add my storm overflow data. As I mentioned earlier, this data is being hosted on the Living Atlas, and to access that, we can just go into Add Layer. This will just bring up my content pane, and this is the content that I myself have uploaded to ArcGIS Online. To get the Living Atlas up, all I need to do is press the drop-down button and go into the Living Atlas. I can now search for my data. And as you can see here, this is the data set that I want. By clicking on it, I can get the item details up. And there's a short description right there. Let's add this to our map. OK, as you can see here, we have now added the data set to our map. But we can see that some points are, even, are overlapping even when zoomed in. Let's add clustering um, to our data set to get a better insight on our storm overflow locations. This just generalizes our data, so it's easy for the audience of our map to gain a better understanding of the locations at first glance. To enable clustering, all we have to do is open the clustering tool on the right hand side toolbar. We can change the cluster radius and the size range if we wish to. Let's go back to styles to change the symbology of my points. And as you can see here, Map Viewer has suggested a couple of different cartographic styles based on my data format. Depending on the type of data, different styles will appear. Let's go ahead and use proportional circles. 
I'm going to change the size range of my circles. And let's change the color. Add, increase the transparency so I can still see the location of the rivers underneath my circles. Okay, you can see here that we have data outside our study area. So now let's add a filter to this data set. We can do this by adding an expression and I want to filter by catchment. And now let's search for the River Tees catchment. Okay, last but not least, we can add a map effect. And map effects are really a cool way to further enhance your cartography. You could add a bloom to make your points glow. Have a blur to blur the data if you wish. But today I am going to be adding a drop shadow. You can change the shadow color, the width, the, off the offset and the opacity if we want to. Once you're happy with your map, you can go ahead and click save. Once saved, you could create a web application to showcase your map. Simply click on the create app button and a suggestion of different app builders will appear. For example, if I click on the instant apps, a new window will open up showcasing a couple of different templates for common workflows. We can take the short quiz on the left hand side here to further tailor my template suggestions. So what is the goal for the app? I want to showcase one or more maps with essential tools. I have one web map and my map does not include an image service. So as you can see, Instant Apps has shortlisted four different templates for me and I can preview each template by using by clicking on the sample button. If I had any time animations in my map, I could use the media map template. If I wanted to create an interactive story, I could use the exhibit template. However, I want to create something a bit more lightweight to push out to the general public, so I will be using the basic template. And it looks like this. As you can see, like the name, it is a basic template with a legend where users can zoom into an area of interest. You could create a secondary web application for your internal staff members, such as an operational dashboard. Um, and this has a bit more functionality so the user can interrogate the dataset further. If you would like an even higher level of customization within your web app, you could use the Experience Builder. This is an application that was created by the Rivers Trust, which uses the same storm overflow data. However, unlike the other applications, you can see here that it is a multi-page web app which combines the functionality of the basic template and the operational dashboard. It even allows the user to download the dataset straight from the application. I would like to highlight that all of these apps were created using the out of the box tools and no developer knowledge was needed. So that is a brief overview of our web solutions. If your organization requires further analytical capabilities, our desktop applications have a wide variety of tools available to enrich your location analysis. You could create um, a suitability model to identify where to place your next charity shop using spatial analysis or use network analytics to optimize your routes for food bank supply chains. We also have some um, solutions for volunteering in the field. Our mobile field apps are perfect to help your organization carry out field operations and reduce your paper waste. For example, our all-in-one data capture field application allows field workers to easily locate assets, edit data, and share finding with others. The maps are dynamic, even in a disconnected environment. For example, if your organization manages Parkland, you may want to conduct field work concerning your infrastructure or your countryside furniture within your park boundaries. 
While our smart survey forms are suitable for both internal and public facing applications. This is a brilliant option for any citizen science projects. For example, you could configure a survey for species occurrence locations and get the general public involved to add their sightings. I'm now going to hand over to Tash, who is going to talk about the power of imagery. Thanks, Balkis. So next, we're going to look at leveraging the power of imagery. And ArcGIS is a complete imagery and remote sensing system, which supports all types and scales of content from different sensors, formats and modalities. So what imagery does it ingest? No matter how the imagery is captured, whether it being from satellites like Landsat 8 or Sentinel to more recent developments into drones or even just using your mobile iPhone, ArcGIS is able to support it. And it also covers a broad range of sensors, from passive sensors like color infrared that capture the energy emitted, or active sensors like LiDAR that emit energy and sense the radiation reflected back. So why do we use imagery? The applications span across many use cases, but imagery can be used as a base map to provide an extra level of context. We can also use it to extract GIS features. So we have data to work for natural disaster assessments um, by understanding where assets are or using for analysis um, by classifying pixel values into land cover for agricultural forestry or even understanding vegetation health. And so imagery can be powerful, but the previous steps of capturing, processing, analyzing and sharing data can be seen as these long isolated workflows that can often take um, a few months or so. We therefore have an end to end drone solution that streamlines this into an automated, fast and massively scalable process using SiteScan. So, as you can see here, this process can be broken down into three steps. Firstly, to plan and capture. So using the flight app, users can quickly create autonomous flight plans for drones that are relevant to the type of site or the asset being captured. Next, the images are then processed in the cloud using the Shure for ArcGIS processing engine and high resolution drone derived outputs are produced. So this could be anything from ortho mosaics to point clouds and to um, really highly realistic textured meshes, which can then be analyzed using some of our inbuilt, inbuilt tools. Then to disseminate outputs, it's um, easy to either download the files locally to a computer or push these data sets directly to ArcGIS Online or your enterprise portal. And additionally, um, if you do have Autodesk workflows, you can publish directly to your BIM 360 cloud um, or using the ArcGIS Autodesk connectors. So let's dive into a live demo to see how this end-to-end -end drone workflow can help nonprofits for disaster response. So in this case um, of an earthquake or natural disaster, understanding what is happening on the ground um, is crucial for saving lives as well as rebuilding infrastructure, like the rubble shown from this destroyed building. So this workflow could be done within a few hours from capturing um, these 230 images to processing and sharing these out, um, collaborating with those in the office and in the field. So from high resolution ortho mosaics, um, it does provide some outputs, um, whether it's contours, a digital elevation model where you can delineate the range here. And you can also use some of the tools to understand what is above and below ground, like this cut and fill. As we start to go here, you can see 
what is above and below ground with the rubble. But you may want to go that step further and start to quantify this. And so we've got several um, tools available here from the line tool to the vol volume tool. So if I select it here, I have delineated the rubble and you can see here some statistics um, showing you how much to cut and fill and that net volume of nearly 1,200 meters cubed. And so this will, can help you act fast and efficiently. And the real power in acquiring these high resolution outputs quicker is it can help um, personnel make quicker and better decisions. And this could be fundamental to help coordinate search and rescue activities. But also within this application, um, you may have noticed that it produces a timeline here. So if you've gone out and flown your drone over different times within the project, the response program, you can review this change over time um, to understand um, the progress and what is happening. You can also view this from high resolution point clouds and also these realist realistic textured meshes. So if I zoom in here, we can see our scene um, and you can understand what's happening no matter where you are in the world and being able to zoom into um, those hard to, to reach areas. Now, this can be shared um, with anyone, as I previously said, and there's some sharing capabilities here on the left hand side. So you could push this out into ArcGIS um, in an application with um, certain capabilities, whether that being 3D tools or just to view. And you can also provide a URL to share with different colleagues. Now let's jump back into the slides. So you can also leverage machine learning within imagery using um, pre-trained deep learning models available in the Living Atlas. So this is giving you a flavor for some of those available here. So you could instantly extract features like recognizing trees to complex shapes like elephants, to pixel classification like land cover to understand what's um, deciduous forest from wet wetlands. Um, we even have available outputs of um, machine learning like the environment agents vegetation object model. So this is derived and classified from LIDAR and um, it's picking out the riparian tree cover. So this is available on the Living Atlas. So you can start to bring this into your projects to um, understand and provide opportunities, um, for example, for, for tree planting. And so there's lots on off offer to really leverage um, the power of imagery. So next, we're going to look at gaining real time situational awareness. And when we talk about real time data, what does this um, mean? So you can think of stationary sensors um, with connected devices and the Internet of Things. And possibly the easiest to think of is um, weather stations. So bringing back data on the um, on the minute or on the hour on wind speed, temperature, precipitation. And this specific map shows weather conditions collected hourly from NOAA. And this is available as a live th feed through the Living Atlas. More traditionally thought of as real time um, are things that move. So this could be the likes of tracking vehicles across landmines or even animal collars across borders. And here you can see vessels tracked to understand the blockage at the Suez Canal. This data was acquired from Spire's um, AIS feeds. You can see here we're, we're gaining better situational awareness of what is happening um, at the scene. And lastly, it could be things that just happen. So this could be anything from traffic alerts or accidents. And we can leverage and ingest this data in several ways within the ArcGIS system. 
So firstly, in Esri Ready format, so ArcGIS um, is inherently a real-time system. So as Balka showed, um, you can field, use field um, apps to capture data and edit data, and this will instantly update um, in other um, applications that this data is deployed. So it's maintaining this one source of truth and making sure that everyone has got a real-time view. Secondly is scripting. So if you have data sets that live outside of the ArcGIS system, you can automate and refresh loading of it into the ArcGIS system through an API. So here you can leverage Python and scheduled notebooks to create your own bespoke um, ingestion mechanisms of your real-time data. And lastly, if you want to ingest a vast amount of data, um, which are constantly refreshing outside of the ArcGIS system, so um, similar to what I just showed you on vessels that are constantly moving or weather stations that are constantly picking up new data. You can use real-time data feeds which connect sensors from IoT platforms, message break brokers or APIs. And here you can modify your real-time monitoring, um, design real-time analytics, um, where you can use filters and processes to refine your, your focus on the specific data and even send real-time alerts. And so an example of this um, is for um, showing New York City buses. So we're bringing this into um, a live feed and using analytics, we're also bringing in New York City traffic to understand when a bus is approaching high tra traffic on a street um, it's creating alert to the, the specific personnel so that they are aware. You can also look at bringing um, in historic data like um, accidents shown over time, um, which you can see here with a chart to see trends for future decision making. And so when looking at real time, um, this could be bringing in your own vehicles or leveraging um, lots of open data. Um, you could understand um, bringing in geofencing to understand, for example, when an animal is heading towards a village boundary and setting up alerts to um, the specific personnel. So this is effectively showing you how can you make better decisions um, and alert the correct um, people. So I hope that Balkas and I have given you a good flavour of how GIS can add value to the nonprofit sector. I also did want to point out that there are um, different add-on licences available via the nonprofit e-store. So firstly, on the left, um, we have Business Analyst, which helps organisations make smarter and more informed decisions um, through its business tools to evaluate locations, understand customers and analyse markets and this is a great tool for site suitability and bringing in a wealth of um, on Michael Bauer demographic data. So for example um, you may want to understand if food banks are in the right location and look at potential future ones. And then secondly we have insights on the right which is seen as a data discovery tool to explore spatial and non-spatial data whether that's um, looking at link charts or regression analysis, um, and it's providing an interactive report. So if you're interested in more information, you can speak to a member um, of the team. Um, but for now, I will pass you on to Luke Phillips from Ramblers Scotland, who will bring GIS to life um, with mapping Scotland's paths. Ooh, uh, thanks very much, Tash. Um, so my name is Luke Phillips and I'm the uh, project manager for Ramblin Scotland's uh, Mapping Scotland's Path project um, and I'm here today to talk to you about what we're working on with the project and how we've been able to use Esri's non-profit programme to make the project a huge success. Uh, next slide please. Um, so firstly a little bit of background on the Ramblers. Um, for nearly 100 years now, the Ramblers has been doing everything we can to make sure everyone everywhere uh, can enjoy nature on foot. Um, we offer a great deal to the walking public. Um, there are hundreds of Ramblers groups across the country doing regular group walks, 
Um, we run wellbeing and introductory walks for those who are new to walking, um, but we also provide formal training on things like navigation, access issues, um, health and safety, uh, and much more. Um, but we also do individual projects like Mapping Scotland's Paths, but also things like our Out There Award Scheme, which specifically works with um, 18 to 26 year olds to provide skills and confidence for getting them outdoors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so onto the Mapping Scotland's Paths project itself. Um, the project started when I joined the Ramblers in uh, the summer of 2019. So we're just over three years into it at this point. Um, and as well as a project having a focus on, on health and getting more people outdoors and active, one of the main drives behind the project was um, trying to provide a solution to the issue that uh, many Scottish paths are missing from publicly available mapping. Um, now, why is this the case? So unlike England and Wales, there is no um, definitive map of rights of way in Scotland. Um, Scotland has different access legislation to England and Wales, which means that um, some exceptions aside that much of the country is open for people to access. Now, this level of access, while amazing, um, means that it's very difficult to build and maintain an accurate map of Scotland's path network. Um, and just to confirm that this was something that was worth um, trying to do and a problem that needed solving, um, Rambler Scotland commissioned some research that found that 75% of people in Scotland believe that more paths on the ground and on maps would help more people enjoy Scotland's outdoors. Uh, next slide, please. So the first step for the project was to see what was actually possible. Um, so to do this, we identified an area in the west of Scotland um, uh, with a good mix of urban and rural areas to run a proof of concept test. Um, the aim of this test was to collect as much data as possible um, from all available sources and compare it with what was currently publicly available. We invited national and local partners to sit around the table um, to help shape the project, identify what we needed to do going forward, but also let us know their experiences in the past from gathering this kind of information uh, and help kind of inform what we're doing going forward to give us the greatest chance of success. Um, and at the end of this proof of concept, um, we found that the network that we'd gathered during this process was um, twice the length of what you could currently find on publicly available mapping. So this clearly showed that this was work, work well worth doing, um, and then it would almost be certain that it's a similar situation across the rest of Scotland. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now that we knew there was definitely a job to do, and that it was likely the same across Scotland as a whole, we had to ask ourselves what it was that we actually needed to do next. So we came up with three main questions, and that was, how do we find all of the paths across Scotland? Um, how do we gather useful information about these paths, such as any access issues, the physical condition of them, um, any barriers to access, and um, just useful information that could help inform the users of the paths themselves? Um, and then how do we know that what we have is actually accurate? So the solution to these issues clearly relied on the help of volunteers and local knowledge. So then the question arose of how are we to put ourselves in the position where we could provide the volunteers with all of the tools they needed to actually take part and contribute to the project itself? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the solution to this problem came through ArcGIS Online and our volunteer hub. Um, so thanks to Esri's non-profit program, we were able to access all of the tools and systems we needed to make the project a success. Um, we currently use three of Esri's apps throughout the project, uh, and this allows volunteers to examine and interact with the network whilst they're on site, um, to complete detailed path surveys to capture useful information about these paths, but also to capture new paths. So whether that's using the GPS built into their phones or things like Garmin watches that are connected to it. Um, and through Hub Premium, we were also able to create our volunteer hub, um, and this is a one-stop shop containing everything that a volunteer needs to take part in the project. So as well as hosting user guides for all our volunteering activities, um, live dashboards and interactive mapping, it also allows volunteers to complete tasks such as path servers through the hub itself rather than being on site to give more options for volunteers to take part. Um, we also leverage the hub to provide public facing issue reporting tools. So this allows anyone to feed into the project regarding if they're regardless if they're an official volunteer or not. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so where have we gotten so far? Um, we currently have a network of around 40,000 miles of paths all across Scotland. Um, volunteers to date have audited around 9,000 paths um, all across the country, um, and they've collected loads of valuable information to help inform the people who may use these paths. Um, we have also captured over 2,000 new paths, which we've added into the network, uh, and many of these paths, as far as we're aware, have not been mapped on any known publicly available mapping to date. 
Um, so we're currently sitting at around 300 volunteers working on the project, um, and these are located from Shetland to the borders all over the country. Uh, and many of these volunteers are, are not particularly techy or have not had experience on working on things like this before. So the customizability and the ac accessibility of the systems we use means that there's very few barriers um, to entry, which has really helped getting um, more people on board. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so thank you very much. It's a very whistle-stop tour of um, the project, um, and I hope you found the slides helpful. Um, if you have any questions about the project or would like to learn more about what we're doing, um, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, my contact details are on the bottom of the slide, um, but now I will pass you back on to Max. Perfect. Thanks very much, Luke. Really good to hear how many volunteers got involved with the project as well. I'll just share my screen and get everything set up. OK, perfect. Um, so we've already had a variety of technical sessions today, and so this section will instead be about some of the opportunities that you've got for showcasing your work and engaging with the wider GIS community. We're always really interested in how you're using our software, and so we aim to help recognise and show the great nonprofit work being carried out by your teams. So we've got several main mechanisms to share the work you're doing and the positive outcomes that result from it. Possibly the most exciting way to get involved is at our annual conference in London. It was great to be back this year after two years where the conference was disrupted by COVID-19. We had thousands of people from across the GIS community, from a huge variety of sectors and organisations, all engaging and talking about GIS. Of course, we'd love you to attend our conference next year, um, but you could also take this a step further by applying to our customer success awards or working with us to present your work at the conference. Our awards are split into several different categories, um, which for this year were field mobility, analytical insights, map creator and community engagement. Fourth Rivers Trust were nominated due to the success of their catchment management plan, which was built using ArcGIS story maps. The British Red Cross were nominated for their new web apps um, that enabled them to better allocate resources in emergencies. And how could I not mention the winners for, of the community engagement category um, who you've just heard from Rambler Scotland. So in addition, um, uh, to uh, winning. They also got a full video demonstrating the work they're doing and that was presented at the main stage of our conference. We were really happy to see so many nonprofit nominees and a winner and it was a really great opportunity to show users from all sectors how nonprofits are making use of GIS. Additionally, we did have some nonprofits hold their own presentation sessions at the conference, giving them the ability to talk a little bit more about the specifics of their workflows. National Trust presented their work on how they're using ArcGIS to visualise data about climate change, and Ribble Rivers Trust gave a talk about how they're supporting nature's recovery in Lancashire while engaging with communities and young people. The next mechanism of communication is through blogs and case studies, which our marketing team help us to promote both online, in newsletters out to our customers, and in our Think GIS magazine. For example, the Red Cross case study was written up and pushed out to the media, um, to the media by our PR team, and it featured in multiple online pages, including Computer Weekly and the Emergency Services Times. Both Balkis and Tash mentioned and used data from the Living Atlas in their demos earlier. We've um, had a number of contributions of data into the Living Atlas from nonprofits, and that includes RSPB, who added their nature reserves, and Plant Life, who added their boundaries for important plant areas. We'd love to see the Living Atlas grow and continue to be a great location to find quality data sets. So please let us know if you've got any of your own data sets that could be added for everyone to benefit from. Finally, we can look globally. So Esri UK are only one of many Esri distributors across, across the globe, and we were really happy that the UK-based nonprofit Site Savers were able to present at the San Diego User Conference in the US. Their talk about how they're helping treat um, diseases such as river blindness in sub-Saharan Africa was a really great example of how GIS can do good. We'll be sending out a link to a lot of the examples I've mentioned here for you to check out after the webinar. 
but really the main takeaway from this section is that we'd love to engage with you and help communicate your valuable work. I'll now pass over to Hattie for some key takeaways. Yeah, thanks, Max. Great. Um, yes, really good whistle stop tour, just celebrating all of the really great things that we've seen from a lot of our existing nonprofit customers. And we hope to see much more next year come through as well. Um, so I just wanted to take stock of everything that we've been showing you kind of over the kind of past 50 odd minutes. Um, and I've got three key takeaways on screen. So um, perhaps just first, my, fee my, my first key takeaway is just for everyone to remember that Esri UK do have a non-profit program um, and this means that the non-profits on the program can access significant discounts on the software, the training, the consultancy, all of that good stuff. So um, if you think GIS could be useful for your work, please do apply for the program today or feel free to take out a free trial. Uh, there will be links in the follow up email or you can also drop any of the members of this team an email. Um, secondly, we've really seen a pretty vast array of use cases um, right from the early kind of start of plotting sewage overflows into our rivers to how to use GIS for humanitarian response um, and again through to things like monitoring things in real time. So, you know, boats or response vehicles. Um, and I really hope that you found at least something in today's webinar that has triggered a new idea of how GIS could be used. So third takeaway is just really to acknowledge that this is a community of users that are working for nonprofit organisations and who really are embracing the tools in their everyday work. Um, we think about the kind of organisations Max was just acknowledging. Um, and, and ultimately, I guess what we're looking to do is, you know, this means a better understanding of our planet through a geographic approach. Uh, we can see what efforts are being deployed where, which is great, is, especially when it comes to coordinating global responses on topics like climate change or humanitarian responses. If I could get the next slide, Max. Um, yeah, so really just wanted to say a big thank you to all of our presenters today as we're kind of wrapping up now. So thank you, Max. Thanks, Tash, Balkis and Jenny from our marketing team who's in the wings um, and running things. But especially a big thank you to our guest speaker, Luke Phillips from Rambler Scotland as well. Um, so you will see my contact uh, is on the screen there, my email. So please do feel to feel free to get in touch if you'd like. And I do wish everyone on the webinar an exciting GIS journey ahead. And if you'd like to stick around for the Q&A session that we've just got coming up now, um, please do feel free to, and we'll just have a look at whether any questions are gonna be submitted into the Q&A box. So I think Max, if you're all right to help me have a look at any questions that have been asked and we'll run through them just to wrap up with things. Yes, of course, that's completely fine. Um... Perfect. And hopefully, hopefully everyone's been able to find the Q&A button on the kind of top of the ribbon in case anyone's searching for it still. Feel free to type in the answer. We can have them come through as anonymous, I believe. Perfect. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask the first question to you, Hattie. So oh. um, someone's asked, I'd like to apply for the Customer Success Awards, but don't know how. Um, are there any tips on what I should put in a submission? OK, um, yes. Yeah, so. Again, I think, you know, with something that's worth applying for in the awards, you know, we're, we're very open to all kinds of stories. I suppose what we're looking for is if we think of the story from Luke at Ramblers there, you know, a, a pretty clear cut case of how GIS has been applied and hopefully some kind of success as well out of it. So if we think about Luke's, it was, you know, you know, there, there, there was a justification for using the GIS and mapping the, the past that hadn't been there. What are the benefits of doing it? It's ultimately looking to get people out and about and enjoying the outdoors. So the kind of story together works really well. And, and I think everyone can see the tangible benefits that have come from the project. So I think if, you know, we, we're very open to having a chat about whatever ideas you've got. So feel free to email us um, maybe what that idea is and we can have a chat. But yeah, definitely would encourage anyone with some ideas to to come forward with them and more than likely, I'm sure they're going to be great. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, there's a there's a similar question, I guess, which is about um, whether or not the workflow they've got could be a case study, um, but they're kind of wondering whether or not it'll be interesting enough. And so again, I think we'd recommend that you get in contact with us. Um, we can take a look at it with you and we can determine whether or not, um, uh, I'm sure first of all, it will be interesting enough and, and 
all of these examples don't have to start with a really complex workflow. They can be simple and just solving a simple problem. And so, yeah, definitely do get in touch with us. Um, yeah. The next question I can see is for Luke, so um, I'll just read that out for you if that's OK, Luke. So um, someone has asked, uh, first of all, this is a great presentation, Luke, thank you. Could you give us some more info on which apps you used for your volunteer path surveys? Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, so to display the path network itself, we started off using ArcGIS Explorer uh, and then from that, that links through to the survey on survey one, two, three. Perfect, brilliant. That's great. Um, and we've also had another question come in that's uh, asking for using the ArcGIS Field Maps app, an Esri login is required, um, make it unsuitable for volunteers to use it. In ArcGIS Hub, would I be able to create a similar open map interface for volunteers to add and edit multiple types of data sets? So I guess this is a bit of a broad question that perhaps our um, oh, perfect. I can see your Tash cash. Is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, you're definitely right. You could do that within Hub um, and create a, a map for volunteers to add and edit. Um, it doesn't have to be just focused in Hub. If you're creating any type of um, web application, you can make that public and you could share that via a link to, to your volunteers. Um, or you could use Survey123, which is less map, map centric. Um, so again, it depends what your end goal is, but yes, essentially you can with ArcGIS Hub. Um, it's a great collaboration platform. Okay, perfect. I think those are the, the main questions that we've had come in for, for the time being. But if you do think of any follow up questions, then as we've mentioned, of course, reach out to us, let us know and we can um, provide you with more information. Yes, perfect. And as I said, the, the follow up email will hopefully be coming out tomorrow or um, a day after that. So lots more links there. The feedback survey as well, just to give a shout out to that, please do fill that in. We're keen to hear where we, how we can keep improving what other future topics to present on as well. So I guess on that, we'll thank you all very much for taking the time this morning. And again, thanks to all the presenters and take care for the rest of the day. Thanks all. Perfect. Thanks.